Let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Yes. Holy Abba Father, we just want to bless you and thank you for this Sabbath day and our convening together in honor of you and Yeshua HaMashiach. And we thank you, Abba. We bless you for his righteousness and his blood that carries us through day by day, Abba, taking us from faith to faith and glory to glory. And we know, Abba, that our whole point of coming together on the Sabbath, not just to worship you, but to seek your word, to seek your Amen. spirit of truth, that we might come to a better understanding of how you work with us, Abba, that this mind that's in Yeshua HaMashiach might be in us as well, and that we walk in the same traditions as he handed them down. And so, Abba, we just ask you and we invite you to bring your Ruach here today to be with us. We know it's already here. We've seen already the kind of talk that we've been having. Amen. And I find it interesting because it dovetails very much into the message that I will present today. I just ask you to use me as a vessel of honor to speak through me, bring things out that I am consciously not aware of, that I can articulate through this message, Abba, that it might be edifying for the body of Messiah. So we just want to bless you and praise you and glorify you for this in your name and the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. All righty. Well, about a little more than a year ago, some of you will remember I did a series teaching on the epistles of John. And somewhere in those epistles, I don't recall exactly which one it was, I had talked about a severe pain that I was having in my ankle, particularly in the Achilles tendon, where it was swelling up a lot and I was limping and there were days where I couldn't walk and I had it on ice and it seemed like no matter what I did, what I took, it didn't matter. And I sought Yahweh's um, instruction on what was the nature of that infirmity that I was having. And I remember distinctly at the time that I had said that I had the sense that this was, even though it was physical, it was really something that was coming from a spiritual infirmity. I only just didn't understand exactly what the nature of why that was coming on me was. And to this day, I still don't know for sure, but what I can say is that in the last two months, it has greatly diminished to the point that I'm not limping anymore. And I would just say that it's, yeah. it's, um, it's sensitive, but not with pain, if, if that makes any sense. Far cry from where I've been dealing with in the last year, because it's really incapacitated me a number of times to the point where it's so painful that my head hurts and I can't think and I can't function. And it got me to thinking, and a while back as I was thinking about it, you know, as I work through the day, sometimes Yahweh gives me the, the title of a message, and that becomes the thrust of what it is I'm going to speak on. And usually a lot of times when I do speak on something, it's usually I try to use something that I personally have gone through. Now, I'm not going to tell you the title yet. I'll get to that in a moment, so just hold your seats. But what I would like to do is let's go ahead and let's start in Acts chapter 7, verse 37 through 60. Acts chapter 7, verses 7, uh, 37 through 60. And what I will say is that in this message, what I want to kind of focus on in this set of scriptures that we're going to read is paying attention specifically to what the message is that Shaul will hear as an unconverted person. So let's start off in verse 37. It says, This is what Moses, who said to the children of Israel, the master of your Elohim, will raise you up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Now this is John speaking, who's been brought before the elders, and they're going to stone him. Okay, And he's pleading, I don't want to get into all this, it's not necessary, I just want to kind of hone in on this particular sec this section of what Shaul, who's standing there hearing this, uh, how this will affect him as we go along through this message today. Um, him you shall hear, verse 38. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. Verse 40, saying to Aaron, make us Elohims to go before us, 
as uh, for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered the sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then Elohim turned and gave them up to the worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? Verse 43, You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your Elohim, Rimfran. Now, some people, and I tend to lean with this, that the star of David is probably this, this Rimfran. There's a lot of historical information to back this up. But uh, that's not really my point here today. Images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witnesses in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern he had seen which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua to the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom Elohim drove out before our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before Elohim and asked to find a dwelling for Elohim of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, he says, Yahweh? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all of these things? You stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, or the Ruach HaKodesh, as your fathers did, uh, so do you. Now, I'm going to stop here just for a moment and say that the nature of this message I'm going to give today has to do with healing, hearing. And I believe that there was something going on with this affliction I was having in my Achilles tendon, which was crippling me physically, but it was also crippling me in a lot of ways, was a, for, a physical manifestation of a spiritual condition of being crippled spiritually. And I believe that that came as a result of not hearing something that was being said to me. And I wasn't acting on it. Now, I, to this day, I'm not sure exactly what that was. I hope and I believe I will get an answer to it with more clarity. I think I have some understanding. I won't talk about that today until I'm absolutely sure. But when you don't hear and you close up your heart, as Pedro was talking about before, and you can't hear what your brother is saying, this will cripple us. This will cause us problems. And I believe that's what was happening to me. So let's move on to verse 52. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you have now become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full with the Ruach HaKodesh, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of Elohim and Yeshua standing at the right hand of Elohim and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of Elohim. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. Verse 58. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Shaul. So he was one of uh, the, the people that was standing there witnessing this whole testimony that John was giving. And yet, even though he heard it, it didn't convict him. It did not convict him. Um, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on Elohim and saying, Master Yeshua, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down, cried out with a loud voice, Master, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, here's what this message is about today. Are you hard of hearing and kicking against the goats? Are you hard of hearing and are you kicking against the goats? Now, a lot of people are probably familiar with the text that I'm talking about, but maybe have never sat down to ask themselves, what in the world are goats? 
and how do you kick against goads. We're going to go through this. So you're naturally probably asking if you don't know what in the world is a goad. Well, to put it very simply, what a goad is is basically a long wooden spear-like device with a metal tip that has a spear at the end of it. And what farmers do is they use that as a goad to prick at the ankles of cattle that are working for the farmer. They've got them in a yoke. And every now and then, this is something when I looked into it, normally they would use ox, but there are other horses could be used, donkeys could be used, and you never mix two different animals together in a yoke. Right. They must be the same kind of animal. And typically they used ox, particularly domesticated ox, and they only generally used males who were gelded, they were castrated, so that they would become more compliant in what the farmer wanted, whereas the female were generally used for nursing and creating babies. So generally it was the male ox that was used. But every now and then when the farmer's tilling the ground with the ox, ox sometimes would act up and they don't want to cooperate. And they want to stop or whatever, or they would, they would kick at the farmer when the farmer's kind of whipping them a little bit or yelling at them and telling them to keep moving forward and they decide maybe they want to, they want to eat or they want to drink or something like that and they don't want to cooperate, so then what would happen is he'd put this goad down near the ankle when the animal was kicking, and when he did, he got punctured with the spear or with the goad. And what that would do is bring the animal back into compliance, and the animal would stop bucking and fighting. So that's what a goad is. So let's move on just a little bit here. Um, the purpose of this goad is that Yahweh is trying to get your attention. Think of it in those terms. When you're going through this life and you're getting afflicted by something, like I mentioned about myself, I kept asking, why is this happening to me? I knew when it was happening, I believed it was a spiritual affliction in my flesh that was causing me to take note of something that I was either doing or something that I was not doing. And Yahweh is trying to get my attention just like a farmer would try to get attention to a cattle who's not following the directions of that master, that farmer who's trying to direct that animal. And so um, Shaul speaks of this happening to him, and we'll get into that scripture now. So if we go to Acts chapter 26, verse 9, Acts 26, verse 9, it says in verse 9, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Yeshua of Nazareth. So he's speaking about this event we just talked about when Stephen got stoned. He was part of the crowd. He heard the testimony. He didn't accept the testimony as legitimate uh, from Stephen. And then he became a warrior for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious sect of his day and was acting as an emissary going out to all corners of the earth in his known time to seek out people who are enemy to Judaism, uh, i.e. covenant of Hagar. And so he wasn't going to have it. And so he was being pricked by Stephen, but his heart wasn't receiving what was being said. So here he's now talking to, I think it's uh, Agrippa, as I break into this. Verse 10, he goes on to talk about, This also I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints who are morally blameless I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly out of measure enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So this guy was a very zealous guy, and I think if you've studied Paul long enough, you come to the realization that this guy was probably a type A personality. This is a guy who would not sleep. He would not rest day or night until he caught the person he was looking for, and he chastised them, and he persecuted that person to the full extent of their known law at the time to get the justification and elevate himself in the ranks. So this is a guy, when I study him, that I find that he is a, I believe that he's not only passionate, but passionate probably beyond measure. 
as he's talking about here. He would go way beyond what he should have really been doing. And, uh, but Yeshua, as we know, came to use this to his advantage. So let's move on. It says, while thus occupied as I journeyed to, Ma to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me saying in the Hebrew language or the Hebrew dialect, Shaul, Shaul, why are you persecu persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick from the heel against the goads. There you go. There's a couple other places where this word is used. I won't go into it. I think this illustrates the point. So what Yahweh is saying is, you're fighting against me. You're fighting against my will. Why are you doing this? This is hard for you to do this. It's not only hard in the sense that it's going to hurt your flesh, but it's hard in the sense that you're fighting against the creator of heaven and earth. And there's no way in the world you could possibly win fighting against me. So we as believers have a responsibility. And what I see through what I've been going through is, is that there are times when things that come upon us physically... We sometimes write it off as, oh, well, I just caught a cold. Well, maybe you just did. We do live in a society where people don't respect, respect the rules of isolation when they're ill, like the Torah says we should, so that you don't contaminate other people around you. Um, we live in a society that breaks all kinds of laws like that. And so you don't know when somebody was just snotting in their hand, and then they go to shake your hand yeah. and they transfer the germs. You know, that can happen. Time and chance happens to everybody, as Solomon says. However, I'm not talking about those instances. What I am talking about is the instances when something is happening to you that really seems to be beyond normal. And it doesn't seem to be coincidental. And what I'm trying to get at is that we should try to ask ourselves what is the nature of this that I'm going through? Just don't write it off as something coincidental. It just happened. Nothing just happens. If you could go into the spirit realm and see things from Yahweh's perspective, he could tell you exactly why this thing came on you, how it came on you, and how long it's going to last. Of course, we don't have that privilege to be able to know that. And so I was fortunate enough that when this affliction was hitting my ankle... I intrinsically felt this was a spiritual affliction. I just didn't have an answer as to what was I doing or what was I not doing or both that brought this thing on me. And it puzzled me. And it was extremely painful. And it was probably more frustrating that I didn't know what the answer was. Because yeah. if I knew what the answer was, I could change it just like that and this thing would go away. But sometimes it's not Yahweh's will to let you know things right away because there's a process that you've got to go through. I like this guy, Marcus Lamonis on TV. He's the, they call him the prophet. He's in business, you know. And he, he always talks to people about he's going into business with. He says, please trust the process. Please trust the process. In other words, I know what I'm doing. Listen to me. Stop fighting me. Stop bucking against me. Stop guessing, second guessing what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm doing. Trust the process. I had to trust that if Yahweh was not giving me the answer as to why this affliction came on me, I had to trust that it will leave eventually. When I have gone through everything I'm supposed to go through, then when I come to the end of that, I'll learn a lesson that will not allow me, hopefully, not to get back in that predicament in the first place ever again. <clears throat> so let's move on here. So it says, from the heel against the goads to prick a stinging poison or goad from a divine impulse. That's what that word means in the Greek, the word goads. Verse 15, so I said, who are you, master? And he said, I am Yeshua, whom you are persecuting. So 
Clearly, he's not persecuting literally Yeshua himself, but he is persecuting Yeshua's mandate of what he was using through the saints here on the earth who are preaching the gospel. So if he's against if he's against one of us, in essence, he's against not only Yeshua, but if he's against, say, Anthony, he's also against the rest of us because we all believe the same thing. So I think you catch the, the drift. Verse 16, But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared for the purpose of seeing something remarkable to you for this purpose. Now, I want to stop here because there was a set of scripture I was going to put in here. I don't remember exactly where it is to illustrate the character makeup of Shaul. And that is the point, the one where it talks about <clears throat> that. Um, did I put it in here? I'm not sure if I did. The one where it says that he had a thorn in the flesh. No, actually, I think I did put it in here. Let me go on. I'll come back to it. Um, so let's move on here. To make you a minister, which is as a subordinate assistant. We need to see ourselves as a subordinate assistant to the Messiah. Just like those ox or donkeys or horses or yoke are a subordinate animal to the farmer who's trying to get a job done. And so to prevent ourselves from kicking against the goads, and not getting afflicted like the way I was getting afflicted and becoming incapacitated in all areas of your life, it's best to try to get yourself into a position where you're not kicking against the goads in the first place. Because sometimes we do it intentionally, sometimes we do it kind of subconsciously, we're not even really aware we're doing it, which was happening to me. I was doing something, I just wasn't sure what it was. So let's move on. And a witness, or as a martyr, both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. Okay, verse 17, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. To open their eyes in order to turn them from the darkness of light and from the power of Hasatan to Elohim, that they may receive a forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are being sanctified by faith in me. So my question is, are you in some way hard of hearing and kicking on the goads? Because I was hard of hearing and I was kicking. And if I wasn't hard of hearing and if I knew what it was I was doing, I probably wouldn't have been kicking intentionally in the first place and not suffer all this needlessly. But then again, there's another argument, which is maybe I did need it. Maybe there's something in my character, in my personality, that's lacking that I needed to go through this through for the length of time that I have gone through it for a greater purpose that has not yet been made understood yet. That's where it takes faith. Because we are supposed to um, sort of covet our afflictions and our trials because we're supposed to take up our execution stake just as Yeshua took his. So we're, we're, he even says that if we don't pick up our own execution stake, we have no part with him. So when these things come on your life, it's very important to go through it patiently, as hard as it might be, and just realize that if Yahweh allowed it to come on your life, it was for a reason and a purpose. Okay. So let's take a look at this thorn in the flesh that I'm talking about. Because what I want to do is I want to drive the point home. What kind of man was this guy, Shaul, that this kind of thing was happening to him? So in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll start in verse 6. 2 Corinthians 12, 6, it says, For though I might desire to boast or vaunt, in a bad sense is the Greek word, I will not be a fool that is mindless and stupid, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain or, tr or treat leniently, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees or he hears from me. Verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure by raising oneself to the point of haughtiness. Get this now. He recognized within himself that of his personality and character, at times, he had a tendency to exalt himself above measure, and he was cognizant of this. We, too, have to be careful that we don't go above and beyond what Yahweh has given us. We don't have that luxury. 
If we get out of control, like that ox is getting out of control, like he wants to get off the path, he wants to go off to the side and eat some grass or something and not stay focused on the job, he's going to get pricked with the goat. And it's going to hurt. Get back on the path. This is where you're supposed to be. Once you get off that path, you're going to get pricked. So let's not be hard of hearing and be keenly keen in to what Yeshua is trying to tell us what our job is, what our ministry is, whether it's for us personally or for other ministry, for other people, not to deviate from that path and avoid getting pricked with the goat. By the abundance of the revelations, a thorn, which is interesting in the, he in the Greek, it's a point or a prickle as an annoyance and a disability. And I can tell you, it was annoying to have this thing because there are days that I would have to go into my office. I can't stand up for more than an hour and work. And I have a frozen bottle of ice I keep in the freezer. And I have to elevate it onto a chair and sit there for a half an hour and, and put that ice on there to bring the swelling down. Then I could go back out and work for another hour. Then I got to come back and sit down again for another hour, half an hour with the ice. It's annoying. It was annoying because my productivity goes down. But guess what? You know, Yahweh's saying, oh, so you think that your productivity is going down. I'm running the whole freaking universe, and you won't get in alignment with me. You're hard of hearing, and i got to keep pricking you because you're not listening to what I'm telling you. You're not doing what I'm telling you to do. So my kingdom is suffering a loss because you won't get in compliance with me. Ah, something to think about. So surely my world and my business is not greater than the Father's business. It's all about perspective. In the flesh was given to me a messenger of Hasatan to buffet me. In other words, bring him under compliance. So you ask, well, why would that be? Because Paul's just mentioning that I have to basically be careful that I don't do things above the measure that's been given to me. If I get out of control and I start doing and saying things, if I start saying, thus says Yahweh Elohim, when he did not say that to you, you are out of line and you are going to be pricked with a goad. At some point, you might get cut some slack for a little while, but if he sees that you're going too much off the track, he's got to pull you right back in again and he's got to get our attention. Lest I be exalted above measure. Verse 8. Concerning this thing, this pricking of the goad, okay? I pleaded with the master, I mean, not the goad, but in a way it's a goad, but in this case it's in his stomach, okay? I pleaded with the master three times that it might depart from me. Verse 9. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength, which is miraculous power, is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, and I'll say here that the way I take this is that when you're weak and you can't get up on your own, you have to rely on his miraculous power to give you the strength to do that. But And that's fine in the flesh, but I'm, I look at it more from the perspective of the character or the heart of the person. In the end, this buffeting of your flesh is what's going to help you get into the kingdom. Because if I don't put that buffeting of the flesh inside of you to keep you under control, you might not just make it. Because you won't, you won't control yourself enough with self-discipline to do the right thing. So I got to step in and I got to use this goad to prod you and stick you in the ankle or stick you in the stomach to, to incapacitate you so that you have time to sit and think and meditate and pray and maybe even fast or look into my word to get an understanding or supplicate to get an understanding why is this happening to me maybe i've gone beyond my measure maybe i've stepped out too far and i'm doing damage to the kingdom now and i'm not helping it i'm not making it grow these are the reasons that i see what shaul is talking about verse 10 therefore i take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Messiah's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Because it really does come down to denying the flesh. The flesh has its agenda. 
and the spirit has its agenda, and the two are not compatible. So it's kind of just like the farmer and the ox, isn't it? Because the ox has his agenda. I had a horse one time, or I bought it from my daughter, and no matter where I took that horse, if he was going down a trail and there was branches and leaves or stuff, you know, hanging over there, she always wanted to stop and grab it, and you know, she'll grab it, and she'll keep walking. So, you know, I'll let her get away with it. But when she stops and she's stubborn and she wants to stay there and keep eating it, you know, I got to keep yanking on the reins to get her attention to say, no, we got to get back to the paddock or wherever I got to take her, you know. So the point here is, is that, that these animals have their agenda, which is to eat and drink. That's what they want to do. They don't want to work. So, but we've got to have the attitude where we got to keep our focus of what Yahweh's focus is straight out in front of us and not lose sight of that. So, my question is, what are you kicking against? If you're really honest with yourself, you'll stop and meditate, if not now, later. What am I kicking against? What's pricking me in my ankle or other part of the body that's rendering me incapacitated? And I'll say this. Stubbornness creates kicking. When we're stubborn, we are kicking. Because that's a stiff-necked people when they're doing that. And so what we need to be doing is we need to be doing Yahweh's will. So let's look at Romans chapter 2, verses 5. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. And it says, But in accordance with your hardness, that is callous and stubborn in the Greek, and your impotent, or unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of Elohim. So, in other words, the longer we decide we're going to stay stubborn and we're going to cop out or we're going to check out or whatever the things that we do, and we're not going to humble ourselves because as the scripture says, he always says, if you, if you will cry out to me, and confess your sins, then I will hear your sins, and then I will look down upon you, and I will forgive you of your sins. But this is clearly the exact opposite when we get into a state of stubbornness, and we're going to get the exact opposite result. And so in verse 6, it goes on to say, Who will render to each one according to his deeds? Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they will get indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. So what are we supposed to be doing then? Well, I would say it's kind of twofold. Number one, you need to be growing within yourself and overcoming your things that you're supposed to be overcoming but then there's the Father's will. And the Father's will, an extension of that, is to be building the kingdom. And building the kingdom requires subjects who are in that kingdom to be built up. Let's look in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. And it says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure that is limited portion of Messiah's gift. Here you go again. This limited measure, as Shaul was talking about, not going beyond the measure. You know, sometimes, you know, I remember in years past, I used to see these evangelists that get up on the stage, you know, when I was still naive in the faith, and, you know, they're slaying people out all over the stage, and, you know, people are falling out, and demons are being cast, and you dream about, man, would it be cool, so cool to go up there on that stage and have that kind of command, you know? Well, you know... Whether you believe that's true or not, what they're doing is not the point. The point is, if you're just a regular little guy like I was at the time who wasn't, isn't anointed for something like that, I, and if I try to do that, I'm beyond my measure. And I got to know my role. It's like the rock says, know your role and shut your mouth. You know? <laughs> and so you got to know what your role is and sit down and be humble and not exalt ourselves above and beyond what's been given to us. So it's important for us to be building the body of Messiah, which is building up other people, esteeming them higher than ourselves. That's not always easy to do, but if you let the mind of Yeshua that's in him be inside of you, you'll always be cognizant of that. 
Okay, of Messiah's gift. Verse 8, Therefore he says, when he ascends on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean, but that he also first descended into the lower Hades grave parts or portion of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended afar above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Verse 11, And he himself, gave some to be apostles that is an ambassador for the gospel with miraculous powers now it's interesting i've seen people out there who claim to be apostles <laughs> self-appointed apostles yeah. now they are fulfilling the one part which is they're trying to at least in their minds uh preach the gospel which is fine and good the question is do you know what that gospel is and i would say most people don't really know what the gospel is and that's a whole other subject on itself. But the other distinction about what makes a person an apostle is you better see miraculous signs and powers following that apostle. And if you don't see that, then he's not an apostle. He might be a teacher. He might be an evangelist. He may, but he's not an apostle. Do not follow somebody who claims they're an apostle and does not have miraculous signs following what they say. And we got a lot of prophets out there self-proclaimed that their prophecies don't come true. That's the next one. Some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Messiah. So there you go. This is the part that we need to be involved with is self. And so in order for us to be effective with that, and I wasn't effective with it for a while because I was incapacitated through my own um, ignorance, it incapacitated me, and so I was not able to edify the body of Messiah. Instead, I needed people to edify me by praying for me so I can break loose of this goad that was pricking me in my Achilles heel and was incapacitating me physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, emotionally, relationship wise, you name it, that was hitting me, you know? And so instead of giving, I had to receive. And that happens, you know? It's not the end of the world. But it sure feels like it at the time, I'll tell you that. Let's go to verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of Elohim to a perfect, a mental and moral completeness of a man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Messiah. There you go. Now it's at that moment that you hit your full measure. But on this earth, at this time, we're given a limited measure. And it's when we go outside that limited measure that that goad pricks us to bring us back into compliance, get us back on that narrow path like we talked last week about that narrow path. Okay, verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness through trickery and sophistry and sophistry basically means, um, uh, what's, how do you say that? Clever but misleading reasoning. Clever but misleading reasoning of deceitful plotting, but speaking truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Messiah. Verse 16, from whom the whole body join and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body and of the edifying of itself in love. So my question again is, are you hard of hearing and are you getting kicked? Are you kicking against the goats? That's for each and every one of us to figure out on our own. I'm hoping that what I'm going through and through this message, it, this goat, this spiritual goat, pricks you into examining yourself to see whether or not something like this is happening in your life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 9 it's interesting, this is another account of the word goads. Goads is actually used um, by Yahweh's words. Right. Yahweh's words is actually a goad. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 9 <coughs> The words of Yahweh are like goads. Verse 9, And moreover, because the preacher was wise, that is intelligently skillful, 
He still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought out to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright words of truth. The words of the wise are like goes. In other words, they're pricking. They will prick you. And the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by these of making many books there is no end, and much study of mental application is wearisome in the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear Elohim and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of mankind. And notice it doesn't say, and this is the duty of the Jew. This is the duty of all of mankind. Verse 14, for Elohim will bring every work into judgment, which is Mitchpot, which Pedro was just talking about, through divine law, including every secret that is veiled from sight of a living thing, whether good or evil. So in conclusion, I want to ask again, are you hard of hearing and are you kicking against the goats in your own unique way like I was? Maybe I still am. Maybe I haven't quite figured out, but the fact that I'm beginning to feel the healing tells me that something in there I must have changed because the condition is beginning to reverse itself. So it, therein lies, I think, at least part of my answer and it may be more complicated than that, I will just have to be patient and wait and see what happens. What answer Yahweh gives me when this thing concludes itself in its appointed time. Now, I want to conclude by this one last set of scriptures that I think is very interesting because we find this goad pricking going on way back in the Old Testament in Numbers chapter 22. And I found this to be kind of interesting. And this is about resisting Yahweh's will. When we resist his will, we will get pricked with a goat. So Numbers chapter 22, starting in verse 9, it says, Then Elohim came to Belem, not of the, which means not of the people, a foreigner, and said, Who are these men with you? So Balaam said to Elohim, Balak, a Moabitish king, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out from Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come, now, curse, malign with stabbing words. Look at that, in the Hebrew, stabbing, like a goad. Okay? Pricking, using words. Then for me, perhaps I shall be able to empower them and drive them out. Verse 12, And Elohim said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go back to your land, for Yahweh has refused to give me permission to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose and went with Balak to, uh, to, uh, went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Then Balak again sent princes more numerous and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me. For I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to, uh, to me. Therefore, please come, curse this people for me. So he's pleading with them. You know, you got to curse Israel, you know. Then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were given to me this house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of Yah. Not go beyond the measure. See, we can't go beyond the measure of what Yahweh's word has said by Yahweh Elohim, to do more or less. So the less is interesting because sometimes if we're given a mandate that we must do something, we need to see to it that we carry it out precisely as Yahweh has instructed us. If you pull back a little bit, you did not do your mandate. And that could cause you to get pricking of a goat as well. So it's not just going over the measure, it's coming short of the measure as well. <clears throat> I think uh, the story where Israel was told to go into one of the countries, I forget which one it was, um, and he said to kill every man, woman, child, and beast of the field, and they left some behind or something like that, and they came back to torment Israel. You know, they, they come short of the measure of the mandate that was given to them, and it wound up haunting them later. 
You don't leave anything unturned, you know? It's kind of like if you owe a debt, you know, and you kind of say, well, I, it's, a, it's a $200 debt, I'm going to pay $195, and it'll just go away, you know? And you leave the other $5 behind. And so three, four months later, all of a sudden you find that $5 has now jumped up to $35 because of penalties and interest and, you know, your late fees and all that kind of And now it begins to build up again. No, you want to wipe it all out. You want to follow it through. Not more, not less. You pay them exactly the $200. It's done. And then you write on the bottom of the check, paid in full. That way when they cash it, that's a legal document. They cannot come back to you for more debt because that's a legal document. That's your contract. Now, therefore, in verse 19, please, you also stay here tonight that I may know what more Yahweh will say to me. And Elohim came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to call to you, arise and go with them, but only the word, the measure, mm -hmm. which I speak to you that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. Then Elohim's anger was aroused because he went, and the angel of Yahweh took his hand in the way uh, as an adversary against him. And as he was riding on his donkey, now note this donkey, now you, you'll see it later in the verses, but in the Hebrew, it's a female donkey. And the reason why it's a female donkey, the emphasis in the Hebrew is because of its docility. They use the female donkey because she's more compliant. A male one likes to buck and fight, very stubborn, but the females, not as much, okay? So this requires an animal or beast of burden who will get in alignment with what Yahweh wants and will do the mandate. So even the beast has to be compliant, okay? And his two servants were with him, verse 23. Now, the donkey saw the angel of Yahweh standing in the way with his drawn sword. Balaam didn't see it, but the donkey saw it. As a dagger, or like a go, it's a pointed spear, okay? In his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. So here's a case like I'm talking about. Balaam doesn't understand why the donkey's doing what the donkey is doing. He thinks the donkey's being rebellious, but the donkey is actually kind of being um, um, helpful to him yeah. and, 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 and trying to do the right thing, but he's misinterpreting. This is where we get into trouble sometimes. This is what I think happened to me in some kind of way that I misinterpreted something and that brought this pricking of this goad into my Achilles heel. And so it's important to have complete and thorough clarity in what you're doing to not step out beyond measure and not below measure, but make sure you're doing exactly what you need to do so that you don't get pricked by this goad. And you stay in complete compliance with what Yahweh wants you to do. It's about walking that narrow path. Here we go. Verse 24. Then the angel of Yahweh stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. It's a narrow path. We are supposed to be going down the narrow path that leads to life, not the broad way that leads to destruction that so many are going in by. Verse 25, and when the donkey saw the angel of Yahweh, she pushed herself up against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot. Now, to Balaam, this sounds like a rebellious animal. But the animal is seeing something very different than what Balaam is seeing. So misinterpretation of your experience can cause you to get pricked by a goat. So it's funny that it's his foot that gets the damage against the wall, so he struck her again. Then the angel of Yahweh went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn neither from the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of Yahweh, she laid down under Balaam, so she crouched down on all four paws and got down to the ground. So Balaam's anger with rapid breathing, so he's going... <sighs> 
what is it with this animal? Oh, I'm going to kill this animal. You know, I want to kill this animal. He's crushing my feet. She's going outside the way. She won't go where I want her to go. But he's not seeing what the animal is seeing. And to me, this crouching down on all fours is like paying homage to the messenger of Yahweh. And was arose and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then Yahweh opened the mouth of the donkey, mm -hmm. and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you, that you have struck me these times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have abused me. I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. So he's still in this interpretation that the donkey is trying to do him harm, <laughs> which he apparently, from what I'm getting, never had a history of doing this. A very compliant animal. So it's out of her nature. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden? Ever since I became yours, even to this day, was I ever disposed to do this to you? In other words, I've never done this to you in the past. And he said, No. Then Yahweh opened Balaam's eyes, and then he saw the angel standing in the way with the drawn sword, oh which could be used as a, go a goad to prick. In his hand, and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of Yahweh said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you. Against you. So he used the donkey to bring correction to Balaam. Because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would also have killed you by now. Let her live. So now he's getting his correction. And Balaam said to the angel of Yahweh, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Then the angel of Yahweh said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word, here we go with measure, that I speak to you, you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. So I found this story to be interesting because Balaam didn't quite understand what was happening to him. The animal understood. And sometimes there are people around us who see things that we don't see. <coughs> and they try to admonish us and help us to see. But as Pedro was talking about earlier, what the closing up of the heart, the hardening of the heart, the stubbornness of the heart, you can't receive the correction. And so you have to be pricked with the goad because you're hard of hearing. So what I'm saying is let's not be hard of hearing. Let's have ears to hear. The Shema, hear, O Israel. Let's hear what Yahweh is trying to say with clarity, with complete precision, so that we don't find ourselves like Balaam and my poor self being pricked with a goad and becoming incapacitated. It still wouldn't be the end of your life. You'll still come through it and you'll still grow from it. But if it's unnecessary, if you can bring yourself, like Shaul struggled with bringing himself under control and not going beyond the measure that he talked about, but knowing your role and not stepping outside that role, we can all save ourselves a lot more trouble. We can all be better at building up the body of the saints and we can do a much better job at building the kingdom and speaking the gospel to people and the power of Yahweh's spirit will be upon us because like the ox that stays on the path, we will be on a clean and clear path, not looking to the left or to the right, but doing exactly what the Father's will is. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. Holy Abba, Father, bless you. We thank you. I praise you, Yahweh, and I thank you for using me to bring forth this message, which I know you've been trying to get on me for a while to do, and I haven't been, but this seemed like a perfect time to do it. And I thank you. I've learned much through this, Abba, and seeing what your word has to say about all these different aspects of scripture and these personalities within the scriptures who just simply did not understand some of the things that they were doing and they had to learn the hard way. Shaul had to learn the hard way. Um, Balaam had to learn the hard way. And sometimes like this poor donkey, other people around us get hurt because we don't fully understand what we're doing, why we're doing it. And we think we're doing it for righteousness sake when we're really not doing it all. We're so far outside your will, it's not funny. And then we find ourselves in a very precarious time, Abba. And then we have to clean up 
a lot of the mess that we create because we really don't understand why we were doing what we're doing and we have to fix and repair the broken relationships around us. Help us, Abba, to take on the ministry of reconciliation, which is another thing that you've given to us. And if we do get pricked by the goads, and if we are hard of hearing, that you will bring us back into conformity of your word and your Ruach so that we can take on the ministry of reconciliation and bring those back who have left out from us, Abba, and bring them back and establish them in the community. So we thank you and bless you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen.